giants. And we're not talking about the San Francisco giants. We're talking about extremely large people. And you know, most people don't realize that in historical biblical times, giants did walk the earth. If you go online and you Google uh, or whatever search engine you choose to use, uh, skeletal remains of giants, boy, that's kind of shocking what you find. Uh, most of it's fiction and, or mythology, and they use doctored pictures, altered photographs to document their claims. However, if we look to the King James Version Bible as our documentation, uh, the, the fact that giants walk the earth is really indisputable. In the Old Testament, we find several tribes of giants listed by name. You have the Raphium, uh, you have the Emum, the Anakim, the Zuzims, and the Zamzumin. And if you don't know where you can find those in the Bible, I'll tell you. Raphium, you'll find uh, who the key, one of the major uh, individuals of that tribe was Og the king of Bashan. We find his, the size of his couch, his bed, listed in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11. He was a big one. Uh, the Emum are listed in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 10, and they dwelt among the Moabites, and it states there that they were as tall as the Anakims. The Anakim, descendants of an individual by the name of Anak, uh, Goliath was also a descendant of Anak. You can read about the Anakim in Numbers chapter 13, verse 33, among other places. The Zuzims in Genesis 14, 5, and the Zamzumim, which dwelt among the Ammonites, you can read about in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 20. No matter which tribe uh, the giants were of, there's one Hebrew word that pretty much sums them up, and you all are pretty familiar with it, I'm sure. Geber is the word. Um, the Hebrew word Geber applies to all the descendants of the Nephilim, that is to say the fallen angels. Many of the Canaanitish tribes had mixed with the Geber, the descendants of the fallen angels, and they were quite large in size. Let's begin our study today with the first occurrence in the Bible of the Hebrew word geber, and we find that in Genesis chapter 6. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. <clears throat> we ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name as always, Father. We ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Genesis 6, 1, and it reads... And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. Now this was God's plan that, to bring forth Messiah. And Messiah would come through the seed line that we're talking about here. That's why we would call Eve uh, the, the helpmate to Eth Ha'adam in Genesis chapter 2, the mother of all living. Because if it weren't for Jesus Christ coming through her, none of us would be living. I'm talking eternal. Verse 2. And the sons of God saw the daughters of men, this is Adam in the Hebrew, that they were fair, and they took them wives with all which they chose. Now, the scripture baffles a lot of people. They don't know that the sons of God as they're called in Job chapter 1, verse 6, are the angels. It's, it's simple. In fact, the Septuagint, as well as the Moffat Bible, translates this word, angels, the sons of God. And some say, well, angels, how could they go into the daughters of Adam and impregnate them? Well, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image. Who was he speaking to? He was speaking to the angels. Psalm 78, verse 25, we learn that man did eat angels' food. 
And 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 also documents that, uh, that as the serpent beguiled, expatio in the Greek language, Mother Eve, Paul was concerned that we would be beguiled, which means wholly seduced as well. Verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. God didn't make man in the flesh in the first earth age. That occurred in the second earth age, and the second earth age only. Verse 4. There were giants, nephil in the Hebrew language, the prime of which is nephal, which means fallen. We're talking about the fallen angels here. In the earth in those days, and also after that, meaning after the flood is what the after that means. When the sons of God, the angels, came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. This word men, check it out in your Strong's Concordance, it's Geber, and it's the giants. This is where the giants came from. They were This was not God's intention. He didn't intend for the angels to come to earth and impregnate human flesh women. And what they got were, in some cases, freaks of nature. We learn in 2 Samuel, uh, there was one who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, but they were all large. This was Satan's plan for Messiah coming to the earth. Satan wanted to pollute the seed of the woman, Eve, so that Messiah couldn't come through that seed line. Verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Every day it was evil. Jude chapter 1, verse 7, These fallen angels, the Nephilim, and their descendants, the Geber, could teach the people of Sodom and Gomorrah a thing or two. It states there in Jude chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, both there in Jude are talking about the fallen angels. Verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Verse 7, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And the short term, he's talking about the flood of Noah's time, other than those who were on the ark, if you hold with the group that think that the entire world was flooded, and none survived except those who were on the ark. And of course, is there going to be any flesh in the, after the seventh trump? No, there's not going to be any flesh after the seventh trump of any kind. Verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. How did Noah find grace? Why did Noah find grace? These are the generations. This is Taledah in the Hebrew. It means the family of Noah. Noah was a just man. He was a righteous man and perfect. This is Tamim in the Hebrew. It means without blemish in his generations. And Noah walked with God. This word generations, check it out. It means pedigree. Noah and his family had followed the preaching of Enoch and not mixed with the fallen angels or their descendants, the Geber. This would be the seed line through which Messiah would come. God's plan, Messiah would come through the seed of the woman. Satan's plan, I'm going to pollute the seed of the woman with the fallen angels. God's plan, flood the earth and get rid of the Geber. 
There was, however, a second influx that we'll be talking about. The, uh, Satan's plan, the second influx, and then God's plan to destroy them with the sword of Israel, the second round, verse 10. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, not listed in the order of their birth. Japheth uh, was the older, the elder. Verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And these angels are coming back. Revelation chapter 12, verses 6 and 7 and the following verses. We learn there that Michael, the archangel, wars with Satan and his angels. And Satan and his angels are cast out onto the earth. That's why Paul wrote in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 10 that we should have Christ over our head. Because the angels, they're coming back. Verse 12, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Verse 13, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Again, the purpose to destroy the descendants of the Nephilim, the Geber, the fallen angels. God would accomplish that the first round with the flood. It wasn't all that long after the flood, though, that we had a second influx of fallen angels. As early as Genesis chapter 12, where it reads that the Canaanite was then in the land. The Canaanites were uh, mixing with the Nephilim. Before Israel moved into the promised land, they wanted to send 12 spies to check out the land of Canaan and see what was the land like. Turn with me, uh, they encountered these giants as well. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 13. Got Leviticus and then Numbers between Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Numbers 13, we're gonna pick it up with verse 17. And, you know, God had told the children of Israel that it was a land that flowed with milk and honey. The first chapter of Deuteronomy, though, the people said to Moses, wait a minute, before we go moving into the promised land, let's send 12, one of each tribe, to check out the promised land to make sure in other words, that it's a land that flows with milk and honey. So we see some disbelief on the part of the children of Israel right there. God told them, did they believe him? No, they wanted to send the spies. That's where we pick it up. Numbers 13, 17. And Moses sent them, this being the 12 spies, to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, get ye up this way southward and go up unto the mountains, these mountains of today part of Palestine, verse 18, and see the land what it is. What's, what's the character of the land? And the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. And this is not a bad idea, sizing up the enemy. Although God had promised them not only that it was a land that flowed with milk and honey, he promised them, there's some bad hombres over there, but I'm going to lead you. I'll go before you and destroy your enemies. So he didn't only promise them the land, he promised them the victory over the inhabitants of the land. In the book of Luke, chapter 14, verse 31, Jesus Christ taught, what king with 10,000 soldiers goes to war without first considering whether he can defeat the king who has 20,000. So not, not a bad idea sizing up the enemy. Know who your enemy is, 19. And what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. Do they have fortified cities or do they just have open villages? And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether they be wood therein, would need that for building, or not, and be ye of good courage, and bring the fruit of the land, 
Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes, August, perhaps even uh, late July. Well, would they be of good courage? So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin, this would be the northern part of the desert of Paran, and to Rehob as men come to Hamoth, into the entering in of Hamoth, which is the northern boundary. So we, they went from the southern boundary to the northern boundary of Canaan is what this is saying. And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where a high man, Shishai and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Zoan in Egypt was the residence of Pharaoh during the time of Moses. Hebron was in existence even at the time of Abraham. But here we have the Anak. They encountered these descendants of Anak, which are known as Anakim. They were big. Verse 23. And they came into the brook, or valley, this could be translated, of Eskol, and cut down from thence a branch with, with one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two upon a staff. It took two men to bear one cluster of grapes, they were so large. And they brought the pomegranates and the figs. It truly was a land that flowed with milk and honey. The grapes of Eskal are celebrated even unto this day. 24, the place was called the brook Eskal because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. Again. Uh, looks like God told us the truth. It is a land that flows with milk and honey. Grapes weren't the only thing that grew extra large in this part of the world. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. In chapter 14, verse 34, in the following verses, we learn that's where God came up with the number of years that Israel would wander in the wilderness because of their unbelief in him 40 years. For each day that the spies spied out the promised land, you're gonna spend one year in the wilderness. 40, of course, in biblical numerics is probation. They failed. 25, and they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. 26, and they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh. This is one of the places that Israel was encamped and brought back word unto them, unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land and it was good. And they told him, the spies told Moses and said, we came into the land whither thou sentest us and surely it floweth with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it, a very fertile land. Nevertheless, or but, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled, they have fortified cities, and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, descendants of the second influx of the fallen angels. God told them that they were there as well, And he promised them, I'll go before you. I'll give you the victory. They continue. The Amalekites, which were descendants of Esau, dwell in the land of the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, and by the coast of Jordan. Now, all of this, instead of encouraging the people to be brave and have courage and go into the promised land is instilling fear in the people. The the 12 representatives, one of each tribe, are afraid and, and they're instilling that fear in the people. And Caleb, he representing Judah, stilled the people. This word still is hasa in the Hebrew. It means to hush the people before Moses, and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, 
for we are well able to overcome it. Let's go. God said that land is ours. Let's, let's go and take it. He would be the only one. But the men that went up with him, these are the other spies, Joshua would eventually uh, side with Caleb. Only two out of 12. Only two out of the entire nation of Israel that would actually enter the promised land. The rest would die in the wilderness. We be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. This instilling fear in the people we learn in chapter 14 of the book of Numbers. A special plague struck these ten dead who made up this false report. If you get in the way of God's plan, prepare to be removed. 32. And they brought up an evil report. This is a slanderous report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Those guys are big. And there we saw the giants, again, Nephil in the Hebrew, the prime Nephal, Nephilim, the fallen angels, and their descendants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. The flood of Noah's time to destroy the descendants of the Nephilim God's intention for the second influx was that the sword of Israel would destroy them. The sword of Israel looks like it's running scared at this point. Let's continue on into chapter 14, a few verses. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. They were fearful of the giants that the spies had told them about. We, we can't go in. We can't go to the promised land. Those guys are huge. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And I'll add against God. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God we had died in this wilderness? This is a, uh, figuratively in Eonismos is what this is called. And this means this is what they were wishing. They're saying, we wish that we had died in Egypt. Or we wish that we had died in this desert. Jeremiah chapter 23, where if you say the burden of the Lord, God promises there, your word will become your burden if you say that. Well, they said, we wished we had died in this desert. Their wish is about to come true. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land? To fall by the sword. We're going to be killed by those giants. That our wives and our children should be a prey. They're going to kill us and then they're going to take our wives and our children to be slaves. Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt. Wouldn't it be better for us just to go back into bondage? You see, that wasn't God's plan. God's plan was to bring them into the promised land. What happened next? Verse 4. And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. And this is all in and out rebellion. You know, at Sinai, when Moses was on the mount for 40 days, what did they do? They said, we don't know what happened to Moses. And we don't know what his God is. Aaron, up, make us a God to lead us into the promised land. The people at Sinai gave up on God. They, they said, make us a golden calf to lead us into the promised land and to be our God. Here, the people gave up on God again. They didn't want to go into the promised land. They wanted to appoint a captain to lead them back to Egypt. 
And then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And they're not bowing down to the people there, they're bowing down in prayer. Moses, one of the great intercessors of all times. Caleb and Joshua were the only two who said, let's go. We can, we can defeat these giants. God promised us that land. He promised us the victory. Caleb would have the opportunity, opportunity to fight against the giants. Turn with me to Judges chapter 1. Judges chapter 1. We're going to pick it up with verse 8. Now the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem and had taken it and smitten it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. Jerusalem uh, in Joshua chapter 18 verse 28 called Jebusi, uh, which is Jerusalem. It was originally allotted to the tribe of Benjamin. And afterward, the children of Judah and I'll add Caleb led the charge and is documented easily in Joshua chapter 15, verses 13 and 14. Caleb, Caleb wasn't afraid of the giants, went down to fight against the Canaanites that dwelt in the mountain, the hill country, and in the south and in the valley, the low country, if you will. And Judah went against the Canaanites that dwelt in Hebron. These would be descendants of the Amalekites, uh, the Anakim, I should say. Now, the name of Hebron before was Kerjath Arba. Arba, as it's written in Joshua chapter 14, verse 15, was one of the great of the Anakim. Kerjath means city. So when you say Kerjath Arba, you're saying city of Arba. And they slew Shishai and Ahiman and Talamai, these all descendants of Anak, the three major tribes of the Anakim. And from thence he went against the inhabitants of Deber. And the name of Deber before was Kerjath Zephyr, which means city of books. And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kerjath Zephyr and taketh it, to him will I give Aksa, my daughter, to wife. And Othaniel, Othaniel would become the first judge of Israel. The son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it, and he gave him, Aksa, his daughter, to wife. This verse got torn up by the Smith's Bible Dictionary. If you have a Smith's Bible Dictionary, uh, check out Othaniel, and it will read that Othaniel was the younger brother of Caleb. They misunderstood it and mistranslated it. Othaniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it. In other words, Othaniel was a nephew of Caleb. Uh, Caleb's father was Jephunneh, not Kenaz. Verse 14, and it came to pass when she came to him that she moved him, Othaniel, to ask of her father a field, give us some land. And she lighted from off her ass, and Caleb said unto her, What wilt thou? She got tired of waiting on Othaniel to ask. She's going to take matters into her own hand. And she said unto him, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a south land, and give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. Water, a very important, uh, valuable commodity at this time. But uh, Caleb was not afraid to fight against the giants. And his victory over the giants led him to be a very wealthy, successful man. He, he had a lot of lands and he could be generous with his daughter and his future son-in-law. Let me ask you this, when you're delivered up before the Antichrist, is that going to be kind of like going up against a giant? I think so. I, I think it's going to be downright scary, especially if you were doing it alone. That's one time you definitely do not want to be alone. 
Uh, you want to be as Caleb and David was in regards to how to handle the fear of the giants. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We have an example there of the Antichrist, a very vivid example of the Antichrist in one named Goliath. 1 uh, Samuel, I'm in the wrong book here. Bear with me one moment. 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to pick it up with verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephes Damam. Now, here you have the Philistines coming into the land of Judah. And Saul's and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. Now, this doesn't mean that they were actually fighting yet. They're, they're jockeying for position uh, in, in order to attack. This area where they're at is about 16 miles southwest of Jerusalem, which at that point in time, you didn't have an interstate that you jumped on in a car and you were there in a short period of time. We're talking uh, two to three days probably travel from Jerusalem. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. On one side, the Philistines on one mountain, Israel on the other with this valley between, facing off one army against the other. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Six cubits, uh, a cubit subject to interpretation. Uh, if you used 18 inches, which would be a, a fairly uh, not large cubit. Uh, that would be an average cubit. That would be nine feet that Goliath was. He, he was of the Anakim. He was a giant. A span, by the way, means a spread of fingers, the width of your hand, in other words. Now, in Goliath, we have a type for the Antichrist. This dude has six written all over him. And I'll point that out as we continue. Just as Nebuchadnezzar had the number six written all over him in Daniel chapter 3, verse 5. And he, this referring to Goliath, had a helmet, that's one, of brass upon his head. And he was armed with a coat of mail, that's two, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. It was heavy. And he had greaves, that's three, of brass upon his legs. You could think of this as shin armor. And a target, that's four, of brass between his shoulders. A target thought to be a small sword or perhaps even a small shield. And the warriors wore them between their shoulders on their back. In other words, it was out of the way. They didn't have to carry it. But in cases of uh, close-up combat, it would be available for them to use. And that's when it would have been used as in close combat. Verse 7. And the staff of his spear, that's five weapons, was like a weaver's beam. A weaver's beam is 26 feet in length. And his spear's head was 600 shekels of iron. The spearhead weighed 18 pounds and the shaft of the spear 26 feet long. And one bearing a shield, that's six, went before him. And this shield would be a shield of the largest size. He, he had an armor bearer that went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a, or better, the Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. I'm, I'm the champion of the Philistines of Gath, 
You choose out your champion and send him down. There's no need for anyone else to get killed. It'll just be one-on-one -on -one combat, winner take all. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And not only this word defy means to mock. And he wasn't only mocking Israel, he was mocking the God of Israel. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9, we learn God will not be mocked. Verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Check out this word dismayed. It means to prostrate, hence to break down, literally by violence or figuratively by fear. These circumstances are being stated so that we can see clearly the fear that was in the people of Israel, which lets us know how brave little David was and how much he believed in God and how much God was with David. Verse 12. Now David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, out of the root of Jesse. And he, this being Jesse, had eight sons. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. Jesse was getting on up in years. David, the youngest son of Jesse, about 16 or 17 years old at this point in time. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to battle. And the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. Uh, Jesse had eight sons in all, and we learn in the next verse David was the youngest. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. Verse 15, But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And for those of you who may not realize it, but David had been with Saul before. You remember Saul had an evil spirit. And they summons David, who was quite accomplished on the harp, to play music for Saul, which tended to calm him. So evidently Saul was much better at the time because we see David going back to his previous employ or occupation, which was a shepherd for the sheep. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening, Goliath, and presented himself 40 days with the same challenge. Send forth your champion. There's no sense in anyone else getting killed. Win or take all. If you can kill me, then you, my people Philistines will serve you. If I kill you, Israel serves the Philistines. Forty days, day after day after day, the same challenge. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephath of this parched corn, roasted uh, ears of grain, and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren. Jesse concerned about his sons. Uh, they've been there at least 40 days, we know from the scripture. Uh, they're probably uh, growing low on supplies. And carry these ten cheeses upon the captain, unto, I should say, the captain of their thousand. And look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. He's saying, bring back a lock of hair from your older brothers, or, or perhaps a letter from your older brothers, something to prove that they're still alive. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Not much fighting going on to this point. There's a lot of mocking going on on the part of Goliath. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight, the place of the battle, and shouted for the battle. Again, all talk so far. 
For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. Verse 22, And David left his carriage, his vessels, if you will, in the hand of the keeper of the carriage, and ran into the army and came and saluted his brother and his three older brothers. No doubt it had been some time since he had seen them. He was glad to renew uh, the, the, the brotherhood. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. Again, that challenge. Send out your champion. There's no need in all of us getting killed or all of you. I'll take on your champion and winner takes all. And also defying the armies of Israel as well as their God. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. No one willing to take on the champion yet. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? He's over nine feet tall. Surely to defy Israel is he come up, to mock Israel. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king, this is referring to Saul, will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. In other words, he'll relieve his house of any public obligation or burden such as taxes. This would be how David would procure his first wife, Michal, the daughter of Saul. Skip with me ahead to verse 32. No takers yet to take on Goliath, the, the giant. Verse 32, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him, because of Goliath. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. I'm not afraid to take on this giant. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. You're, you're but a boy, and he's a seasoned warrior. You don't have a chance. This is the, the first step of David taking on the kingship of Israel. In chapter 16, the previous chapter, we had Samuel, at God's instruction, anointing David the king of Israel. And David's kind of going, wait a minute, Saul's still alive. How can it be that I'm going to be the king of Israel? This is the first step in that long and arduous road for David. But it also shows us that God gives you what you need to accomplish his work. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock, the lamb symbolic of Israel. <clears throat> David stating his case why he can take on the giant. And I went out after him, the lion, and smote him, and delivered it, the sheep, out of his mouth, and with God's help, he's saying, I'll deliver Israel out of the mouth of this giant. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, by the mane, in other words, and smote him and slew him, taking care of the sheep. David, a type for the great shepherd, Jesus Christ. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And, his uncircumcised, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. David had faith in his Lord. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Good luck, and God be with you. You're going to need it. And Saul armed David with his armor, with his own armor. And he put on the helmet of brass upon his head. And also he armed him with a coat of mail. 
you can kind of see little 16 or 17 year old David standing there and probably finding it rather difficult to stand under the weight of a full grown man's armor. And David girded his sword upon his armor. And this is Saul's sword. And he essayed to go. He, he was sizing everything up. For he had not proved it. He hadn't trained with all these weapons. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. Just, just give me my staff and my sling. I am practiced with them. I'm experienced with them. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. These choosing of these stones just exactly like in Revelation chapter 13 verse 18 where you count the stones, where you count the number of the beast, where if you know the key of David, you know who the Kenites are and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. He had proved himself with the sling. You know, there's one armor that David does have on. It's not Saul's. He has the gospel armor on of Ephesians chapter 6. Well... Let's, let's size this all up now. Here we have a seasoned combat warrior in Goliath. He has a spear that's 26 feet long and the head of it weighs 16 pounds. He has shields. He has an armor bearer. He has this and that. And what does David have? David has a staff, a stick basically, and his sling. Well, it's looking kind of bad. It's looking kind of bad for Goliath. 41. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him, the armor bearer of Goliath. Would you be afraid as you saw this giant approaching? Nine feet tall. David, but a boy. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. This means he hated him. For he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. David was a, just a boy. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog? And a dog, there's no stronger term of contempt for the Philistine that thou comest to me with staves. You come to me with a stick. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. His gods were Dagon and Baal. His gods didn't amount to much. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beast of the field. I'm going to tear you apart, boy. Don't expect any mercy from me, is what Goliath is saying. Then said David to the Philistine, out of the mouth of babes, Psalm 8, Matthew chapter 21, verse 16. Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. That's where you put your confidence, Goliath. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. That's where I put my trust and confidence, Goliath. 46, David continues, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air. Not just you, Goliath, but your whole army as well and to the wild beast of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Goliath was mocking the God of Israel. David was saying, my victory over you will prove that there is a God over Israel. 
47, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. It's important for you to remember in this time, what's going to happen when that seventh trump sounds? Is it our battle at that point in time? No. No. It's the Lord's battle at that time. Now, we have some very important things to do up until that seventh trump sounds. Uh, When you're delivered up, though, that's what this whole message is about. I want you to remember Caleb. I want you to remember David, who didn't forget about their Lord. They trusted in him. They believed in him. And David, proving that there is a God of Israel, with his courage to stand before this giant. Verse 48, And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. I'm sure Goliath probably was expecting David to run the other direction. He's probably quite surprised that David has the the brass not only to fight him, but to come running toward him. He's anxious. No sign of fear. David trusted in the Lord, do you? And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. You ever heard the saying, the bigger they are, the harder they fall? Uh, That's where this saying, that, that saying came from is this sequence of events here. The big ones fall the hardest. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and the gospel armor, I'll add, and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David, but Goliath was in his hands. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. In the next chapter, uh, the women of Israel would sing, Saul has slain his thousands of Philistines. David has slain his tens of thousands. I mentioned earlier that Michal, the daughter of Saul, would become the wife of David. But you remember, there was a little deal where David had to gather the foreskins from 100 of the Philistines as a dowry. Because David said, hey, I don't have any money to give you a dowry for Michal. And Saul said, well, then bring me 100 foreskins of the Philistines. And do you think they lined up voluntarily to give a donation to David's cause? I don't think so. David brought 200 foreskins. David was a mighty, grew into a mighty warrior. But he started as that youth with a sling and a stone, taking on the giant Goliath. And I want you, when you're delivered up before the giant, the Antichrist, to remember Caleb, to remember David, that the, the war isn't ours. We put our confidence not in a sword, not in a shield, but in the God of the armies of Israel, whom he, the Antichrist, is defying. There is no reason to fear. Uh, we have the victory. It's been promised. Don't let your father down. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Father, that so amply and readily tells us, Father, of how things are going to be, these these types that, that you gave us, Father. We know exactly what's to come as we study them. Let everything that we do the rest of this day be the honor and glory of your name, Father. We also lift up our military troops and our our police officers, our our law enforcement officers. Father, they were in harm's way. We ask you to watch over, guide, direct. In Jesus' precious name, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead, 
or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Them and their Heavenly Father. But uh, again, when you study with us, you're in church. Uh, wherever two or more are gathered in His name, He is right there in the midst of them. And He's here right now. Darla in California. Words cannot express my gratitude to our Father and your great teaching for these last two years. I am a recovering alcoholic and here to witness that after 35 years of drinking, God and the Word of God taught truthfully brings a total change and completes healing. May Lord bless you all that you continue your teachings. And thanks for sharing that witness. And uh, we, don't, we receive a lot of letters like this. We don't share all that many with you in the audience, but I felt led to share that one. The Word of God is powerful. The Word of God changes people's lives for the better. I am out of time. I want you to know that I love you a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. Your Heavenly Father wrote that letter to you, the Bible. It makes His day when He sees you seeking knowledge from Him and about Him. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that and to reach out to others as well? Most important this, you stay in His Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645. 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.